plates of like this fine china, um, very, very old. And uh-huh. these, these construction guys were having a field day just breaking this stuff, breaking the box. Oh, yeah. And, and I've seen them like, break it oh. before. Oh. I know. They don't know. It's just trash to a lot of people. Oh, did I ever tell you the coffin story? No. You did, but, you know, I don't know if our listeners uh, have heard that, but that one, I've told that story a couple times. I don't talk about, you know, um, whom that story came from usually because, um, but, yeah, you should tell that again for some of our listeners that probably yeah, have no clue. Yeah, new listeners, then I should probably just tell it again. Basically, uh, when if, even if the old ones, because I'm sure everyone yeah, would want to hear the story say, I twice. I don't know if I remember it. <laughs> You'll it, remember I, it once you hear it. The it same struck th- me so hard, I still think of that a lot. So oh, lot it's that. just like, it, it cuts deep, man. It does. Yeah, I basically I was... How'd this start out? Uh, 20 years ago, I was in downtown San Francisco, really old port gold rush city. Obviously, a lot of people know the history of that, you know, city that was built by the California gold rush, 1849. And there's lots of old stuff buried below the downtown because it was a big cove. And that's the, the ships that were sailing from Europe and around the horn from the eastern United States to bring supplies and people to the California gold fields, they'd, their first port of entry would be the um, in San Francisco, and a lot of the ships just went into the cove and never left. <laughs> All the, the sailors on the ships and the crew, everybody just abandoned the ship to go to the gold fields because they thought they were going to get rich. So why would you want to be a lowly seaman when you could be, <laughs> you know, your pockets could be laden with California plaster gold? So, uh, you know, there was all these ships in the harbor and all this trash, and they slowly started filling this harbor and now and turning into what is now downtown San Francisco, the financial district. So I was I was down there on, kind of on the edge of the city where an old dump area was, and they had, they had dug up a big pile of black mud dump stuff from the 1880s, like in a sewer construction project. And I was raking through the pile, and this guy comes up to me, who was part of the project. He was a, he was a construction worker dude and he was, he was a heavy equipment operator. And he says, Oh, what are you looking for? And I said, Oh, bottles and artifacts. He's like, well, you better hurry up. We're going to haul all this material to the, to the classified dump, you know, the landfill where they take all the toxic stuff and it's going to be buried, you know, crushed and buried forever. And I'm like, yeah, I'm trying. And he's like, you know, I've found some pretty crazy stuff. And I'm like, well, what do you found? You know? And, <laughs> he's like well one time i was digging in the old cove in this excavation site we were really deep and i uh i dug up with the piece of equipment in the this giant scoop of this excavator this big black coffin rises from from the mud and and and, and, and he said he got off of his uh seat and he went he's like holy shit and everyone gathered around this coffin and somebody wiped the mud away from the window. It had a glass window. And inside the glass window, you could see like a fully dressed, uniformed dead guy with like just all the regalia, like a dress sword and the brass buttons and the shoulder epaulots and the belt, you know. And it was from what he described, it could have been maybe a military officer, maybe a California militia member or something and for some reason he was buried down there and uh maybe a burial at sea maybe a navy officer and he floated and sank in the cove i have no idea but the the superintendent runs over and he's like what what's everyone looking at he says oh my god smash that thing right now and 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 and, and and the guy's like, what are you, are you kidding me? I'll just put this in my truck. He's like, what are you going to do? Carry it out on the sidewalk in front of a bunch of people and put it in your truck? And if the archaeologist on the site sees this, the archaeologist is at lunch or something, because they have to have an archaeological monitor for all those sites. Some of them obviously don't do their job well enough. <laughs> and, and so he's like, 
smash that thing into a million pieces right now before the archaeologist sees it. Because if they do, they'll hold up the job and it'll cost us all. We'll be sitting here while the archaeologists do a giant excavation and the developer will lose all this money and we will too, yada, yada, yada. So it's all about money, right? So he, the guy didn't want to, but he said, you know, if you don't, if you don't smash that thing right now, you're, you're off the job. So he took his, his, uh, his bucket and he just pulverized it. It's just so sad. I mean, the links we go through to preserve history and save history and all because, you know, money and not wanting to hold up a job and oh, it's just oh, so sad. Oh, the stuff that pe- I mean, the stuff that people find when they dig that they don't give a crap about. It's amazing. And it's not even the stuff. It's the the context where it's buried at that teaches you a lot about the story of how that object even came to be there. I mean, there's all these things that are just getting lost and destroyed. I think that's one of, one of the things that I try to, with my content, I try to show to people that, Oh, it's, that there's so many reasons why this stuff has significance and tells a story just where it's sitting right now. And everybody right. should be watching out for this. Now for, for those of our listeners that haven't listened to how you got started, how what got you first interested in, in the bottle aspect? I don't know. I was just bottles. always obsessed with them. I mean, basically my first word was bottle, really. It was bottle top. Really? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I just, cool. I don't know. Something about, I remember, well, I don't know if I, I might have told, again, I might have told this story also in the last podcast because I have a tendency to ramble and forget what I said, but I think I was on a beach when I was five years old. I really remember this. And I remember this like um, big aqua homeless guys, like big brandy bottle washing up. That wasn't even that old. It was maybe like four years old or something. And it was an, it was like an E and J brandy bottle, but it had a cool aqua kind of shape to it, a figural shape. I remember it washing up on the beach and it was kind of sandblasted and it looked kind of old, even though it wasn't, I was like five years old and I was just, I was just mystified by it. I'm like, wow, who used this? You know, like, even if it was recently, like it's, what was the story of the person that used this? What were they thinking when they, this homeless, maybe a homeless person was, you know, some bum was just like drinking somewhere. And what, what was his life like? I just remember having these types of thoughts, even though I was five. So as much as I could comprehend about being homeless when I was five, I mean, my parents told me about it and I just had what I, what they told me to go on. But I just remember being really like, it, it just, it was inspiring for my imagination. I was like, wow, what's the story of this? You know, how'd this get here basically? And thinking about all the possible people that interacted with it and, how it came to be, you know, how it got thrown in the, in the bay or whatever. And that's a true treasure hunter right there. When, you know, when you're young and you start thinking about all those different possibilities and different things. And uh, that's something I think a lot of us can relate to for sure. Um, At a young age growing up. Yeah. Appreciating old things. I've, I've, I, I know that Amanda and I've, had that discussion before and uh that that's really cool um so um i know amanda's got several she's got a list of questions for you yeah it's oh, yeah. so something that we usually talk about at the end but i think we should actually touch upon now is your youtube channel mm-hmm. so when did you when did you create your youtube channel and how did you decide that you were going to interact like with your uh, subscribers and the people who watch your videos in such a way that you, your, your telling of history and your storytelling is phenomenal. I absolutely love it. Love watching your channel. So, so when did you get started uh, with the YouTube channel and how did, you know, how did you just decide to just kind of evolve it this way? 
Well, I'm going to be really honest because I don't want to seem like I'm like the most virtuous, perfect person in the world, even though everyone else tries to do that with <laughs> on social media <laughs> these days. <laughs> I am morally superior. No, I'm not. I'm just like a frail human, too. So to be perfectly honest, when I started digging and looking for privies and finding all this amazing stuff, I was younger and I wanted to keep it all to myself and my, and my partners and not have any competition and not have anyone know what I'm doing. You know, I just wanted to go out there, get rescue every single little thing that I could from every place before it got destroyed and not have anyone else, you know, out there looking for the same thing. And the less people, the better that know about it. Good. You know, and I had that mentality because I was interested in my own personal enjoyment of it. And I really, there was a, there was a point about four years ago where I started to, I mean, it was longer than four years ago, but this is when I started the channel was four years ago. There was a point when I started to think, you know, not enough people get this, not enough people, if enough, if more people knew about how cool this is and all this stuff that's out there and all these, this history and these stories, that would be a net positive for like in society. I think <laughs> like people, hobbies are wonderful. They make people happy and people, and people love stories and people love history and people love treasure hunting. And why am I just being so secretive? Because it was kind of this feedback loop with my digging partners. Everyone's like, don't tell anyone anything. Don't know. You want to want more diggers out there, you know, and everyone's telling me that my whole freaking, you know, the whole time I'm digging. And finally, I'm like, you know, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I think to a certain extent it is. But then also, I want to, like, show people how cool this is. I want, I want to bring people on this journey. I want to record what I'm doing and, and, and have it recorded for posterity to show, like, context of things. And, 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 and also beyond that, not only film the actual digs, but give information on the history of the place we're digging in a way, or, you know, like the type of place we're digging, are we digging behind a house or a saloon and how's the trash going to um, be different behind a house, saloon, hotel, a church, whatever. And, and then, and then give in-depth history on what we're finding and why, why did somebody, you know, what did a breast pump from the 19th century look like? You know, what did a, what was a uterine supporter, you know, and who would, who would have used something like that? And all these weird things you find. And, I, I just recently, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to broadcast this. I mean, <laughs> it's, 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 it's not exactly conventional and it's weird and it's dirty and it's dangerous and, you know, but I think a lot of people are going to enjoy it. And I think people should be seeing it. And I have to say so far, it's one of the best decisions I've ever made because I get, I just got an email today. I get these letters from people in the form of email and direct message on, you know, social media yeah. now instead of letters. But they say, they say, thank you. You know, I, this is entertaining for me. It's like, it's there. It's therapeutic to get off work and, and watch this, watch this process of discovering things underground. And then you give these stories and have music and, Exclamation! Exclamation! Jesus Christ! <laughs> explanations of um, what you find and the history behind those objects and the people that may have thrown them away. And this is like entertainment. I'm enjoying it, and and that that means a lot. I, I realize. I think history is kind of a dying thing in our country. You know, we live in a society where you know history is now like not politically correct or whatever and people want to forget about it and move on and be like really cool and and everybody in history was obviously wrong or you know whatever <laughs> a lot a lot of the way people talk about history now so I'm kind of scared that younger people now when they're growing up not only are they on their phones inside instead of outside digging in a landfill like I was in middle school but a lot of them don't even get that choice because they, they're given these phones at su such a young age. So they're just on their phone and then they're, they're getting taught by, you know, just <laughs> whoever, you know, <laughs> that, well, you know, history isn't, so true. 
is kind of shameful in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, and another thing you hit hit a point there too. Uh, you know, a lot of the new generation, and including 